The gravity of the time is such that every new avenue of peace, no matter how dimly discernible, should be explored. Never before in history has so much hope for so many people been gathered together in a single organization. You will provide a great share of the wisdom, of the courage, and the faith which can bring to this world lasting peace for all nations and happiness and well-being for all men. So we are here today with Jason Crawford, who is the author of Roots of Progress and in my opinion, the next great public intellectual. So thank you for joining us on the show. Oh, you're far too kind. Uh, thank you for having me here. I've uh, enjoyed listening to some of the past episodes and it's great to be on. Yeah, well, I've enjoyed reading your blog and it's so funny because I think like you know, two people told me about you within the same week and they're both like of the Silicon Valley you know, technology elk and so, elk, elk, something like that. And so I'm beginning to think that you are like, you, like you're, your thinking and the education that you're doing in the world is like, you know, kind of finding its way through different crowds. And so I'm excited to see where it goes next. I'm excited to hear about it. Uh, but before we get to like your current effort, can we just rewind all the way back and kind of figure out who made you you and what your story is? Yeah, sure. Well, so it's no coincidence that you maybe heard about me from Silicon Valley type folks, because that was my career for almost 20 years. Uh, my background's in computers. I uh, did a CS degree, computer science, um, was a software engineer, engineering manager, and technology startup co-founder. Um, did that for almost 20 years, uh, have lived in the San Francisco Bay Area for over a decade now, uh, started to, you know, two technology companies while I was here. And then, uh, you know, about a year and a half, almost two years ago now, um, decided to take a kind of major left turn in my career and become a writer. Um, I, so in 2017, I started this blog. It started out as a side project. It became an obsession, and then it became my full-time uh, job. And uh, the theme is basically the history of technology and the philosophy of progress. So how did we get here, right? Um, what, what created sort of modern industrial civilization and the standard of living that we all enjoy? And um, why did that take so long? Like, why would why why did we, people kind of suffer and die for like thousands or tens of thousands of years before we finally kicked off the industrial revolution? And then, you know, how do we keep it going? Like, what's our vision for the future based on all of this? So that was kind of the initial motivation. Been been blogging about it for you know for about four years, and then about like I said, a year and a half, two years ago, I decided to go full time on it, and uh, I'm now working on a book. That's my big project. Amazing. Um, the topic is amazing. I mean, it's something that like I feel like. At least my group of friends, you know, growing up, not growing up, like, you know, after grad school, you know, a bunch of engineers, like we talk about this, you know, this is the stuff we talk about over beers. And so it's interesting to see someone who's made like their full time passion out of it. Let me ask, though, the articulation that you just laid out so eloquently, was that the initial conception of what you wanted to write about? Or did that evolve over the first six months, 12 months of working on it? Um, it evolved, but I would say it evolved pretty quickly. I mean, so I've been interested in history for a long time. Really funny because I, I was, it was my least favorite subject in school. I thought it was utterly boring and I avoided it as much as I could all through high school and college. And then in my 20s, uh, I started to realize how important it really was and tried to begin to make up in adulthood for a kind of deficient education. Um, and that in my 30s, that turned into me realizing that I had not studied the history of my own industry, the computer <laughs> industry. And so I started reading about that. And that was fascinating. Yeah. Um, and so then, you know, around 2017, 2016, I decided I wanted to broaden that maybe to the whole industrial revolution. Mm. And, um, and I quickly decided to actually broaden it to essentially all of human progress. Um, it was inspired in part there by a book I read by Joel Mokir, uh, who's a pretty well-known economic historian and uh, one of my favorite economic historians. Uh, he wrote a book uh, called that just came out around the time I started this project called A Culture of Growth, Ooh. where he talks about the very idea of progress and how Ooh. it's not a natural idea. It's not an idea we had for most of human history. Uh, and in fact, it was kind of really in the... Um, say 16th and 17th centuries that uh, in Europe in particular where that idea 
evolved into its modern uh, you know, form and how necessary that cultural foundation was to create something like the Industrial Revolution. And so wow. once I read that, I was like, wow, yeah, this is a big story and I really want to I want to I want to cover the whole thing. Yeah. That's so funny because I guess until you just said that right now, my assumption was always that there are some like evolutionary forces that have guided the way humans have developed, you know, up until the point that we are today, you know, just some drive that's like built into our genes. But what you're saying is that there's, there's this cultural element of it that almost created like a step function change in in how we allocate resources that that led to this period of i guess hyper growth as compared to anything before that period yeah so um there certainly is a step function i mean so if you look back at the broad sweep of human history going even back to um prehistoric hunter gatherer days you know you can go back many tens of thousands of years um it's arguable where did kind of human civilization quote unquote begin but um uh, there has been progress of some sort for, you know, tens of thousands, arguably hundreds of thousands or millions of years, you know, potentially going back even before the origin of our own species. You can see gradual evolution in stone tools, you know, from the historic record. The stone to the first stone tools that were used some two and a half, three million years ago by our human-like ancestors, uh, Homo habilis or whatever, uh, you know, those are, are sort of relatively simple and crude. And then by the time you get to like, you know, 20,000 years ago, the stone tools have actually advanced quite a bit. They're like, they're much better, uh, they're, they're much more finely formed. You know, the original stone tools are, it's just a big rock with a sharp edge chipped off of it, right? And then by by the, the end of the stone age, you get these, you have these like very finely formed arrowheads and um, a, a, a greater variety of tools. And like, so it's like, wow, yeah, even in the stone age, there was progress. It's just, it was just a lot slower, right? Yeah. Um, so like maybe progress was measured in like millennia at, in that period. And then you get to um, sort of like maybe the ancient and medieval world where progress is measured more in like centuries, uh, you know, and then and then now maybe progress is measured more in decades. And who knows, maybe in the future, it'll be measured in, in years. Um, <laughs> you, well, actually, do you think there are any, uh, I might be getting way ahead of myself here, but do you think that there are any like cultural um, built in like barriers to progress to make sure we don't go too quick? You know, like, like kind of like get off my lawn type stuff, making sure it like is like a natural like brake pedal, um, you know, just from kind of ge like generational pushback. Like the older generation tends to be more conservative in the way they do things, but they also tend to control the power and the money. And so maybe is there that um, resistive function? Yeah, well, so I think another thing you learned from studying the history of progress is that there has always been opposition to progress. Anytime there's been something new, um, you know, it's it's gone through the kind of uh, ignore, ridicule, uh, fight, uh, accepts, you know, uh, uh, pat pattern, right? Where uh, at first, when it's not obviously working, people will just sort of laugh at you, tell you you're crazy, think it's never going to work, or it's never going to be important. It's never going to, um, you know, I mean, I was just reading a story of the, the first Reaper machine, and they're doing a demonstration of it, you know, and it doesn't work very well the first time because, of course, it's a brand new invention and it hasn't been tuned. And, you know, some guy there whose job is uh, to, to, to reap the wheat by hand with a scythe, um, and he's, he's standing there watching. And, of course, when the machine breaks down, he's, he's, you know, he laughs and he holds up the scythe and he's like, well, this is the way we're always going to do it, you know. So there's like, there's always that kind of mentality. Um, but uh, so, I mean, I guess, sorry. So, so the, the, what I was saying was, I think you can look at this at two different levels. So at one level, progress has always happened. It's just happened faster or slower and it's been accelerating, you know, um, but at the same time that doesn't, so, so, so on that level, there's nothing different between now and the stone age. Um, but, but if you just look one level up, like there are these fundamental differences that do result in changes in uh, the velocity and even in the acceleration. So like um, sometimes you might look at the, the, at the picture of like world GDP over, you know, all of human history, and it looks like this big, you know, hockey stick curve. You might look back at that and squint and say, well, I don't know, is that just like an exponential curve? That's all, it's just been growing, whatever, a constant percent every year for all of human history. And it turns out, no the rate of growth actually did increase um, a, a couple hundred years ago. Um, and, and there might have been other increases as well. I would bet there was a major increase at least around the time of, uh, you know, agriculture and settled societies and maybe around the time of writing and, you know, those sorts of, I haven't looked into that. 
Um, but certainly around the time of the Industrial Revolution, there's a there's an increase in the um, even in the rate of growth. And so uh, there was something fundamental that changed. It wasn't that there were uh, it wasn't that there were uh, suddenly inventions for the first time where there had never been inventions before. There are plenty of inventions before the Industrial Revolution, right? The plow, the compass, the printing press, uh, you know, the spinning wheel, there were uh, the loom. There were lots of things. Um, it's just that they were spaced out so far, right? Um, there were even, this is a, a, an interesting point from Joel Mokir, there were even inventive periods where there was like this efflorescence, right? This flourishing, brief flourishing in one time and place. Like, um, like of chemistry in France. It was like all of the guys, like the heroes of chemistry, all knew each other, all went to the same coffee shop in France. It's crazy. <laughs> yes, although now you're getting into the scientific industrial revolution. So, but even right. before that, if you look back at like ancient Athens, right, there was this brief period of, I don't know, 20, 30 years when like a whole bunch of new fields got established and these great plays got written and stuff was figured out in mathematics and so forth, right? And then there was another one in Venice in the, I forget, 14, 1500s and et cetera, Florence and you know, during the Italian Renaissance and so forth. But what was kind of different and unique about the industrial revolution was not that an inventive period began. It was that it never ended. It oh. was that it, it was actually sustained for hundreds of years up to the present day. That's what's unique about the Industrial Revolution was that it, it wasn't a flash in the pan or a brief kind of one generation long thing. Somehow we got something fundamentally right and 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 built it into the culture, built it into what got passed down, you know, to later generations, such that we kept this thing going over over many many generations, and it's just built on itself, um, and it's been this reinforcing cycle of exponential growth for now 250 or so, you know, years. Amazing. And so this is this is a thesis that was laid out in this book that really had an impact on you, and you and you're like, I want to explore this further. Was that is that the basic idea? Yeah, definitely. I think that was the point where I decided I was going to broaden this from just the industrial revolution to like all of human progress. Um, and I've mostly been focusing on technological and economic progress, sort of material progress. Um, long term, I am also interested in the growth of knowledge and science uh, and kind of history of science, which I've, I've barely, you know, dipped into at all. Um, and also the history of moral and social progress. And I think uh, at the end of the day, all three of these things, uh, sort of technology, science and um, society, are really like three strands of a progress rope that are uh, intertwined and ultimately inseparable. Uh, it sounds like you're writing an encyclopedia, not a book. <laughs> <laughs> well, the first book is going to focus on uh, just the the sort of material and technological uh, part. So the the story of industrial civilization. Yeah, yeah pretty amazing. Um, can we just kind of dial back a little bit to your emotional state when you were like, I mean, like, do you have an identity crisis? Like, because I mean, like when you switched to like thinking of yourself as a writer because i mean like listen I, I went through you know after you know after uh my like my first company and like when i was trying to figure out what to do next um like i went through a bit of like an identity crisis like do i want to get back in the tech space or not and then um i've seen this with other friends too this is like a common theme amongst entrepreneurs at least like in my cohort where it's like there, there's some moment maybe around your 30s or mid 30s where maybe there's an identity crisis happening. Like, what was your emotional state as, I mean, because you're giving up a lot, like you're giving up everything people know about you as a technology entrepreneur and how you've defined yourself at every cocktail party, everyone you ever know, you have to give that up in a certain sense. What was it like? Yeah, um, it's funny because it was paradoxically, at, it was an identity crisis, absolutely, just like you described it. And at the same time, it was just kind of very natural and obvious what the what the right step was. Um, I, I think you're right that people go through this, especially founders, um, especially if they're maybe switching over from between uh, being a founder to being a, a VC or something. I remember when Mark Andreessen uh, started uh, Andreessen Horowitz, uh, his v, uh, venture capital firm. He said something. He joked that he was going over to the dark side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but um, yeah, for me it was like even a bigger thing, right? Because I'm kind of I'm, I'm almost leaving all the hard sciences and and technology and engineering and going into this kind of very uh, you know into this humanities area um, that's really about history and philosophy. Um, and yet, I mean, I've always been interested in in philosophy, and and I've been interested in history for a long time. It was also, like I said, it, it kind of grew up very organically as a side project. It was just a blog. It was literally at first just a reading list. It was just books I was going to read. Then I got interested enough to start writing about them. But for the first couple of years, I didn't, I wasn't trying to promote the blog at all. 
And then at summer of 2019, a few things happened in a row. One was that I had this breakout blog post that hit number one on Hacker News and got went viral on Twitter and it got um, uh, it was on Kotki, if you know that blog, which is like one of the oldest blogs on the internet. Um, and uh, and so I got a whole bunch of new you know subscribers for that. Uh, that what post, was that post by the about? way, yeah, yeah, it was um, it was titled uh, "Why Did We Wait So Long for the Bicycle." And it was asking why was the bicycle not invented until like the late 1800s, right? What were the that's a sort of good title to too? That. Are you are you like I know journalists sometimes who um, like a lot of their job is just writing catchy headlines. <laughs> Has that been like part of your blog um, endeavors, like trying to figure out what is like a good catchy headline? I don't know. Yeah, you know, I mean, I do put a little bit of thought into that, but um, it's so difficult to predict which blog posts are going to go viral. You know, you just have to you're just going to have to write a lot. Yeah. and um, focus on sort of like volume and, and regularly turning stuff out and then, you know, something will hit. Uh, um, yeah, so we, I, oh man, I want to take this in so many different directions. Uh, <laughs> um, wait, can we just do a quick synopsis on, on what that, that first blog post was? Because I know some people are probably dying to hear about that. Yeah, you what? Know, why did we that? wait so long for the bicycle? Yeah, right? yeah, probably uh, wait for long for the bicycle. But just so in case I forget, I also want to talk about process and like what your sure. routine is and oh, how sure. you write so prolifically. But okay, first the bicycle. Okay, so uh, to to really summarize this, so a lot of people, so I asked this question on Twitter, and a bunch of people replied and had hypotheses, and then I looked at there were other sort of hypotheses around the web, and like nothing was totally satisfying. So I went and researched it. Um, you know, uh, people said, oh, maybe it was roads. We need to wait to get better roads, but actually, it turns out that like. The roads mostly improved after bicyclists came along, and the bicyclists were some of the people agitating for better roads. They were part of this, uh, quote, totally good roads that. movement in the early 20th century. Um, and, uh, you know, there were sort of various other things like proposed, but, um, oh, horses was another one. People were like, oh, well, you had horses, so you didn't need bicycles, but that doesn't really make sense either. Um, because uh, a horse is a bicycle is actually a lot cheaper than a horse, and you don't have to feed it, and you know it's useful in different scenarios and so forth. Okay, so I looked into it. Well, so one of the things it turns out is just like the right design for the bicycle was not at all obvious. In fact, um, for a long time, I think a lot of effort was wasted in people trying to make uh, large four-wheeled contraptions. So they were essentially trying to make like an automated carriage, um, like a like a carriage without a horse, you know, but also didn't have a motor. It was human powered, and these things were just like too big and heavy yeah. to really get going. Um, so then finally in the early 1800s, um, somebody kind of basically, rather than trying to make a mechanical carriage, they try to make a mechanical horse, like just a little two wheeled thing. Okay. But the first bicycle proto bicycle didn't even have pedals. It was more like a scooter, like you would, um, or like they had these for kids some day these days, instead of training wheels, you have you, it basically, it's just low enough that your feet touch the ground. And so you can balance with your feet, but you also push forward with your feet. There's no pedaling. And that's basically what the first bicycle was. And so then like, it's like decades, and this became a brief fad, um, but then kind of died out. Um, uh, and then decades later, like somebody puts pedals on the bike, finally. Okay, so now you can pedal it. Well, that's cool. Except the way they did it was they attached the, bicycle, the pedals directly to the front wheel yeah. of the bicycle. And uh, this is okay, except that like, you don't get a great gear. Um, you, you don't get good sort of like uh, gear advantage, right? So like you yeah, have to- Yeah, your power to speed ratio is fixed. It's like you're stuck in first gear essentially, right? Okay. So, um, oh, and the other thing was that at the time these bicycles are made of like wood and like cast iron and um, there's no rubber on the tires even. So their tires are like maybe wood with iron uh, you know, rims or maybe they're just made of metal. And so, um, you know, that kind of, that kind of sucked. Uh, and they were really, uh, they were really bumpy. So one, one model around the 1860s or so was called the bone shaker. That was uh, an indication of like how bumpy of a ride it was. It was like no shock absorption. So um, anyway, so to deal with both of these problems, they started, what they started doing was making the front wheel bigger and bigger and bigger. So maybe you've seen the really ridiculous looking late 19th century bicycle. It's called the penny farthing. Uh, or there's one name for this design, but it's got this enormous front wheel and the rider is perched like way up high and it looks super dangerous and it was, but it solved two problems. One was the bigger wheel gave you a better like um, lever advantage, right? So you could, you weren't stuck in first gear essentially, right? Pedaling all the time. And then the other thing is that a larger wheel is better at shock absorption. Um, but yeah, it was super dangerous and required almost acrobatic balance. So finally, you know, they hit on the design where the pedals are not directly attached to the wheels. Uh, instead, the pedals are in the middle and they're connected to a wheel by um, uh, sprocket and chain. 
and um, uh, and then around the same, this is like 1880s. Um, in fact, they called it the safety bicycle. That was its like key feature was that it was safer than those penny farthings. Um, and then the other thing that happened was they started doing rubber tires and then eventually uh, uh, pneumatic inflatable rubber tires. And so that uh, helped with the shock absorption. And so by the late 1880s, you got like the design that we would recognize as the modern bicycle, but it took most of the 19th century to do that design iteration. Wow, late 1880s, that, the car was very soon to follow after. And to me, a, ca a car should be way more complex than a bicycle. <laughs> Well, so I think part of part of what is like, uh, you know, when I went into this, I was kind of thinking, oh, the bicycle is not that complicated, right? It's this relatively simple mechanical thing. It doesn't require any scientific breakthrough, you know, and this is true, but I think it's easy to underestimate actually the manufacturing complexity. So like um, the other thing that was going on in the 19th century was the development of machine tools. It was hard to uh, create like precise parts that would fit together well. So like creating those sprockets um, and creating the chains and like all of the yep. parts of the bicycle and doing wire spoke wheels. And then like um, later we were able to do uh, hollow tubes for the bicycle, which made it lighter. And so all of these things were sort of like fundamental manufacturing, like materials and manufacturing innovations that were getting developed during the 19th century that really made the bicycle like practical and convenient and reliable and cheap. And so I think that's the other uh, sort of part of the story uh, of, of, you know, why it took so long for this to become a, a practical thing. Um, I, okay, uh, thanks for that. Let's talk about process. And then I also have another question teed up. Man, I got a lot. I have another question teed up for you, but let's talk about uh, your process first. Yeah, okay, sure. Right. Or at least, and maybe tie it back to the kind of history of, of, of this, this, whole, um, this whole journey for you. So you get this one big post. Um, does that like, does that make you feel good? Is that like, okay, I can do this. People are going to listen to what I say. Now I better like get to work and I'm going to do one a week now or something like that. And what happened? It was a boost, certainly. You know, um, uh, it, was, it was gratifying to get the attention. It was also gratifying that um, to get retweeted or reposted by some econo uh, economists and economic historians. Um, so in, in actually in the course of researching this, I got connected with a guy named Anton Howes, who uh, is is now one of my favorite economic historians, um, and uh, you know, and so he posted it, and I thought, okay, well, it's like a, a professional in the field thinks yeah. this is worth reading. That's cool, right? And um, Tyler Cowen, uh, who's an economist at George Mason, and has been instrumental to the whole progress movement. I, that was the I, I mentioned. By the way, there were three things that happened last summer, and we only got to the first one. So the, <laughs> let me just briefly interject. Like the second Please. thing that happened, like literally two weeks after I wrote this post, was there this article came out in the Atlantic. Um, under the headline, we need a new science of progress. And it was authored by this guy, Tyler Cowan, who's an economist at George Mason, wow, Arcata Colin. Center. Yeah. Um, and then the, the other co-author was Patrick Collison, who's uh, the CEO of technology company Stripe, yep. um, which is a payments technology company. And so the two of them co-authored this thing that came out and they called for a new discipline of progress studies. And it really, this article really galvanized a community. Um, there were a bunch of people like me who were all interested uh, in this, you know, very sympathetic to this progress concept, but we just didn't know about each other because there yeah. was no name for it. And yeah. all of a sudden, you know, a bunch of people were kind of like writing posts in response and uh, talking about getting, hey, let's get together, let's chat, let's have a Slack group, you know, like a community. Uh, and so this really, this kind of this movement in this community got going. Um, around this concept of like, yeah, progress is important and it's kind of underrated. Like we should be paying more attention. We should be studying it and so forth. And so I would say that was the other thing, like those two things happening at the same time. Um, and then the third thing was just like, for independent reasons, I decided to quit my job. And so I was looking for something new to do. And, and so coming back to this question you asked me of like, well, how did you make this shift and wasn't it an identity crisis? Yeah, I kind of was. And yet at the same time, this study and this research and writing was just what I was obsessed with. And it was like the one thing I couldn't imagine not doing. Like if I had, I considered taking another job in the tech industry and I went and I interviewed and I did a job search, but like, I knew if I took one of those jobs, I would feel compelled to keep the blog going as a side project. Whereas I also knew if I, if I did the research and writing full time, uh, I would not feel like I had to do anything else. Like that could completely consume me. Yeah. And so like a good rule in life, I would say is when you're that obsessed with something and especially if it's been going on for like, uh, if it's been building for like a couple of years, go for it. Like do whatever you need to just like focus on it full time and do it now, don't wait. That's my life. That's my Amazing. little life advice. We'll tuck into this episode. Oh my God. I, you know, I, offline, you and I have to have a couple more beers to, <laughs> I feel like your path in my, like, I just feel like there's so many parallels. 
and maybe I'll interject with just like a little um, anecdote myself as to please. And, and maybe you feel this, maybe you don't. You tell me. But I think that there is something about um, the process of discovery that can like inject like a new energy into it, like a human being that just, like they never felt before. I I have um I have an uncle who's like this old Korean man. Um, like literally in Korea, like I I've only seen him twice in my life, but I went out to visit him. Um, and he had like discovered the Rosetta Stone that connects the Korean, Japanese, and Chinese cultures from like w way back when. But but the, the crazy thing about this guy is he's like 93 and he hops upstairs, like literally hops upstairs, kind of like Yoda. It's not, it's it's so crazy. And and I spent I spent like you know, a few days with him and we we're just chatting about this idea of discovery and and he like and he essentially told me about this about like when you feel like you have like uniquely discovered something in the world like the energy that it gives you is like nothing else and so I'm, and I felt that when I started on the nuclear journey and I'm wondering does does that resonate with you as as you start to discover things? I mean yeah totally right it's the and it's the combination of discovery and creation right. It's both what you are learning and also kind of the vision you have for something you want to bring into the world. Um, and that's, you know, that is the sense in which this is at a very, very deep level. This is not like a pivot for me at all. It's just continuing. I mean, every time I started a company uh, or certainly when I, the, the most recent one, it was, uh, it was because I had a vision for a tool that needed to exist, uh, some software that, and I really desperately wanted to make that vision real and, 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 and create it and bring it into the world. And now it's the same thing, only, um, you know, only my vision is more around kind of like an intellectual program and books that I want to write and, you know, things that I want to create, uh, courses I want to create and online. And it's, and it's that sort of thing. But there's still that same kind of fundamentally creative drive that feels very similar. Yeah. Um, process. Do you keep yourself to a schedule? How do you decide what, what to write and when to write it? Yes. Um, my schedule has not been regular because I keep uh, getting involved in projects other than just the core writing. So for instance, last summer, I got commissioned to create a, uh, a high school summer program uh, around the history of progress. Um, that was done through a, uh, a private high school called the Academy of Thought and Industry. And uh, we cre I created that program last summer and ran it uh, for, I, I taught it for one cohort of students. And then there were some other cohorts taught by other instructors. And uh, the school liked that enough that they wanted to just turn it into part of their core history curriculum. And so then I've been, I've been doing that work with them as well. So, you know, that's a thing um, that's been going on. Um, and then, uh, you know, so so these sort of projects come up. Um, I am I'm trying to clear my schedule as much as possible to work on my book, um, but you know, at the same time, I wanna I wanna also write posts for the for the blog so that I uh, you know continue to connect with my audience. Yeah, that's how um, you sell your book. I mean, you're essentially writing. I, I mean, I just think this blog thing um, is just the, the perfect way to write a book. You're you're building a loyal audience. You're doing like continuous marketing. This is before you've even gone through the hard work of actually compiling everything. Oh, and you are processing your ideas along the way. And do we have to write? It couldn't be better. Exactly. In fact, the other thing I'm doing along those lines right now is um, I'm doing a, a, a series of monthly discussion groups based around the book uh, kind of as I research it. Um, this is through a platform called the Interintellect, which is uh, kind of a platform for, for, for doing these uh, kind of intellectual discussion groups. And so I've got a series going on where, um, I mean, I have the outline for the book. And so every month I just, uh, I give a little talk about the next chapter. And so that, you know, it's, it gives me a chance to present work in progress, but also to, um, to get feedback from like an early test audience. And I think that iterating with your audience before you even write the book is pretty, uh, it's pretty important. Yeah, it's super important. And you almost kind of wonder how other authors don't do that. <laughs> like, how do they write the whole book without iterating with their audience? Yeah, I mean, I think as of at least like a decade ago, this was the only way to write a book. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, so let, I want to come back to progress, and then eventually we'll get to nuclear at some point. But sure. <laughs> um, uh, okay, uh, on progress. Can I ask, um, because I read some of your posts, but not all of them, so I don't know if you've already like explicitly addressed this or not. Are some types of progress inevitable based on like broader societal forces? Or is progress up to like individuals, like and whatever unique characteristics they have at the right place in the right time? Um, you know, I think there's a way in which both of those are true. Um, so first off, uh, progress as such is not inevitable. 
And I think we see this, again, simply from human history. For most of human history, there was very little progress going on. Um, and there are, and in fact, there have been times when there's been regression. Um, look at the, the West after the fall of the Roman Empire. You know, the, many things were lost for hundreds, you know, for a thousand years. Um, and, and, you know, similar kind of collapses or regressions have happened in other places and other times. So we cannot count, there's no inevitability uh, to history. There is no um, uh, progression that is just sort of unfolds independent of human choices and actions. Um, I think, again, this is one of the lessons of Joel McKeer's book. Uh, progress happens when we resolve to bring it about. And that was the big thing that happened in the West in the 15 and 1600s and then going into the Industrial Revolution. Um, so, uh, but then, we, okay, but then as progress is moving forward, uh, it, it, like given that it is moving forward, uh, I think there are at least some major discoveries and inventions that are more or less inevitable. Maybe the exact form that they take is not. But, you know, I think it was fairly inevitable that as long as the Industrial Revolution kept going, we were going to discover electricity and figure out how to use it. That's just too big a deal. There were too many people working on it, right? There's, there's no way I think we could have avoided that. Yep. As a, to take an example, right? At the same time, um, you know, it's the exact form that these things take, uh, I think, is somewhat contingent. The, certainly the timing of them is contingent. Um, uh, you know, <laughs> there was this quote from Simon Newcomb, uh, who was this um, scientist around the turn of the last century. He said something like, you know, it's remarkable to think, uh, I forget the exact wording, but it was something like, essentially, if you just removed about two dozen men from the last few hundred years, you could have like killed all of progress. Um, and I think that's not quite true because I think other people would have stepped up. But I think if you do remove those key people who made those key figures, you could easily set a field back by a decade or a few decades, yeah. right? Um, because and, sometimes it does take that long for the next discovery to come along. And here's something else that I've played around with in my mind. Let's say it's not dependent on the individual, but is it dependent on this idea that you know, humans are a bell curve, and there's like going to be the 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 tipper at one end of people who are just because you mentioned it before. It's like you know, people are like society resists against you when you do something new. Like, are there people like is, is there like a rebellious gene in the human population that is just so necessary to advance things forward? Like, people are still willing to do stuff even though everyone tells them an idiot, and there's just enough of those people that are just always messing around with chemicals and messing around with geometry and hurting themselves to make something real. Right. I mean, so yes, I think it, it's, you know, it's not the case that if you, uh, you know, that if you took out one particular inventor that the invention that he's credited with would never have been made. In fact, there are so many cases of simultaneous invention, right? Um, you know, I mean, even sort of Edison and the light bulb, right? There was another guy, Swan, in the UK who had essentially invented the light bulb. And, um, uh, and you know this because um, Edison fought every patent battle as hard as he could, and he did not defeat Swan. They had to, they had to end up um, doing a deal together uh, to, in the UK to sort of manufacture. Well, they, they made the, uh, they called it the Ediswan uh, company. Um, so like, uh, you know, but I mean, Edison was the one who created the entire like electrical system and he deserves credit for that. But um, so, you know, it's not the, you know, if you removed Edison, electricity still would have happened. The light bulb would have happened. Um, it would have taken a longer, I don't know how much longer, but it, it, you know, it would have happened eventually. But, um, you know, if you keep, if you keep removing those people, right? Like if you play some game where, where you then you remove the next guy who invents the light bulb and the next guy and the next guy, like what percentage of humanity would you have to remove, right? I suspect it's a very small percent to essentially kill progress or to lengthen it out by orders of magnitude, right? Like, like certainly maybe if you took the top 1% and maybe just a fraction of a percent of the most kind of like intelligent, creative, rebellious, as you said, sort of like non-conformist, um, the people with the, with the drive and the ambition and the talent to like make these breakthroughs. Yeah, like a very, a, a, a sort of small sliver of, of humanity is, is, is really what kind of moves the world forward. Um, everybody's contributing in some way, but if you, if you took out this, the, that very small sliver, um, I think progress would more or less grind to a halt. And in a sense, you can, you can sort of think that that is kind of what happens in societies where there's some sort of taboo against innovation right well, can I ask that? yeah if you look at times where there are times and places where there's kind of like 
very strong orthodoxy, um, whether it comes from religion, whether it comes from uh, kind of like in uh, medieval China, where there was this sort of uh, just, you know, a real va cultural value of stability and, uh, and, 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 and to, you know, to led to some degree to conformity, right? Like when you look at these things, um, it's essentially the social factors that are quashing that small percent uh, or fraction of a percent of people and their and their innovations, right? Yep. Um, okay. As you're you know continuing to write and continuing to learn, are there any topics that uh, offer? You know, I, I mean, so what do you do? So you, like, I, I know you do a lot of like book reviews. Is that like one of the ways that you kind of keep? Keep you know, increasing your own base of knowledge as you're be like, here's a book that's been recommended to me. It seems like it'll be good. I'm going to read this with the intention of writing like a really thorough book review. Is that like one of your main ways of kind of moving yourself forward? Yeah. So um, I do write book reviews when I encounter good books or books that I think are sort of interesting to talk about. Um, uh, I never go into a book thing thinking like I will definitely write a review of this. It's more of an after the fact thing. If the book was interesting and coherent enough and I didn't like get bored and skim half of it, you know, um, uh, but you know, that's been a, that's been a good way to do things. Um, sometimes I write posts that are not book reviews, but they're just my synthesis of what I've learned in an area. And maybe I had to read a few different books plus several articles, plus, you know, kind of some other things to like piece it all together because there wasn't a great book. That was the case for like the history of iron and steel, for example, yeah. uh, was one of the posts that I wrote. There was no one book that just told that story in the way that I thought it should be told. So I had to sort of synthesize and integrate a number of things. Um, reading books, though, is a great way to kind of advance the knowledge. Obviously, you have to always be doing that. In the beginning, that's all I was doing. I was just picking up fairly popular, you know, popularized histories um, back when it started as a hobby, essentially. Um, now I'm a little more directed, like I'm writing a book, I've got an outline, I have chapters I want to do. And so now I'm digging more into things. And also, as it's become more serious, you know, as it's become a job and not just a hobby, um, uh, it kind of holds me to a higher standard. So now um, I have the responsibility and also the time to go read primary sources, read scholarly papers, and, you know, and so I'm incorporating more of those things. Um, sometimes when I pick up a book, especially if it's more of a scholarly book, I'm really more just dipping into a few chapters here and there that are relevant to what I want to do rather than reading it all the way through. But I still pick up interesting books. Um, uh, another uh, one that I, uh, that I recommend, uh, recommended to you, and, and I think would be great for your audience, is called Where Is My Flying Car? Yeah. Um, really, a really interesting uh, sort of uh, book about some very broad topics um, in, in terms of progress and stagnation. And I'll tell everyone to go read your post on that book um, immediately because I did and I loved it. And now I got to find this book on Kindle. They, apparently they don't publish a hard copy or something. What's it's only, yeah, well, it was self-published by the author. It's only on Kindle uh, right now. Um, but it's $3.14. Believe... So that makes an easy break. Yeah, pie dollars. Yeah, pie dollars. <laughs> <laughs> I believe there is a, uh, I, I, I think I can say this, there's a, there is a, a new edition coming out from a publisher. Okay. So um, yeah, so, so be on the lookout for that. That'll probably be in hardback. Yep. Um, okay. So, so you were, rec sorry, I cut you off. You were recommending that book to our audience. Why? Oh, uh, I just think it's, uh, it's really interesting in terms of, uh, it's a very broad look at progress and stagnation. Um, and uh, it's also a, so it's a work of kind of social analysis and commentary of how we, how we lost the future that we were promised in the 1950s. Mm. Uh, and it's also a, a work of futurism. It's sort of like, where, where could we have been now and where could we be in the future if, if progress you know, gets to continue? And by the way, one of the major, um, so one of the major themes of the book is the importance of energy. Yep. Um, in fact, uh, he, so uh, the, the author, Jay Storrs Hall, talks about how uh, energy density the requirement for energy density actually correlates pretty well in kind of a subjective fashion with which technologies uh, did we think we were going to get in the 1950s that did not come true. So if you if you look back at like the, the last 50 years or so, like the, the absolute um, fastest progress has happened in computers and information technology, right? And it's the one area of technology that does not require high energy densities. Yeah. Because in computers, you actually make progress by having things take less energy. Whereas in you know manufacturing or transportation, you tend to uh, you know uh, you tend to make progress by using more and more energy, right? But, but this is particularly ironic, and I think would resonate with this audience. 
um, because we did have a way to solve the ever-increasing requirement of energy density problem in the 50s, in the 60s, right? We invented nuclear energy, and that, and that could have um, enabled yes. all of these advances in these other fields. Absolutely. And so nuclear, the, the potential for nuclear technology is one of the other major themes in the book. Um, uh, and it, one of the things that the book opened my eyes to was kind of like how many different things we could, are, are possible with applications of nuclear physics that have never even seriously been tried. So true. I mean, I think about this uh, like an unfair amount, I mean, because I'm so immersed <laughs> in this space. But it's like, you know, when I have, you know, once again, these like, like late day talks with friends and talk about the world that, that could have existed, just knowing, you know, having such a, like a, like a deep foundational knowledge of, of what we can do with, with nuclear power from, and also from being a mechanical engineer from, and understanding, you know, the material constraints, the thermodynamic constraints of, of any given systems that we operate in our day-to-day -day life and how you can jump up the curve, you know, orders of magnitude by just kind of making the heart of a system like, a, you know, an atomic heart. Um, it, it, in some ways, it's kind of depressing because like I can, you know, I, 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 I dream of cities in space that could have been uh, if we just kind of, you know, put a nuclear rocket together. <laughs> it's like there's so much. Yeah, totally. Um... And so, uh, you know, uh, Paul says essentially that the nuclear industry was strangled in its cradle. And, uh, and I think that's also, you know, something that resonate with you and, and your audience. Uh, he, he also coined a term, um, ergophobia, the, the fear of energy, <laughs> um, okay, to, to, to sort of, uh, well, really just to sort of, uh, uh, you know, put a name to this, this this kind of pathological fear uh, that was part of the um, you know especially the environmentalist movement in the 1960s and to some degree even to today um, that I was ask, uh, you know is this like tied to like elitism and like the elite like don't want other people to have stuff so they keep it from them. It's even deeper than that. You know there were quotes in the book along the lines of um, you know discovering a cheap abundant source of energy would be the worst thing that could happen. Oh, or, uh, you know, giving, uh, giving a, uh, you know, like fusion energy or some other, you know, really amazingly powerful, cheap source of energy to, uh, to humanity would be like giving a machine gun to a toddler, right? These are the, this was the, the attitude that was taken by some of the leaders of the environmentalist movement around the 60s and 70s. Um, and I think this is one of the deep things that, uh, you know, contributed, a major contributing factor to why the industry really stagnated. Wow. Um, what else have you learned about nuclear? Gosh, I've learned a lot of things. So I've been researching it these last couple of months. Um, I uh, uh, will probably be coming out with a report on essentially kind of what went wrong and where are the bottlenecks today and kind of like how could we potentially, you know, make forward progress. Um, so I've been researching. It's actually how we got in touch. Yeah, um, uh, yeah I think... Um, the one of the things I've learned, and uh, you know, I did a little Twitter thread about this, which I think actually led to this interview, which is kind of like essentially every problem that everybody complains about about nuclear power already has an engineering solution, and uh, and many of those engineering solutions just haven't been put in place, uh, and engineering or some other you know type of solution, and they just haven't been put in place because the industry was essentially frozen and moves at the at a, at a glacial pace you know so people complain that nuclear is expensive like look there are ways we know ways to build kind of faster and cheaper and we just don't do them um, they complain about the waste and yet there are there are ways to process the waste there are also ways to not even generate the waste or to like use more of the fuel um, you know people complain about proliferation and there are designs that like are essentially non-proliferating designs right um, and you might even argue about whether it, are these even real problems, or are they just sort of political or social well, problems. Okay, okay. Yeah. You always jump to my next thought. <laughs> <laughs> but even setting that aside, it doesn't matter because solutions are on the table, right? Yeah. Oh, load following. Here's another thing, right? So you'll hear people say like, oh, well, the problem with nuclear power plants is that they can't do load following, and therefore... Um, you know, they can't, they can't be like our, solve all our power needs. And it turns out that's completely an artifact of like the particular plants and the turbines that we happen to use. And in fact, this has already essentially been solved in France. And there are, you know, there are different turbines and different like ways of, of doing this that allow you to do much better. Um, and then if you go into, if you get into uh, uh, Hall's book, the, the flying car book, um, you know, he talks about some even more futuristic advanced kind of speculative things like, um, 
uh, chainless nuclear reactions where you're you're not actually um, using a chain reaction to generate energy, but you 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 need like an independent neutron source. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and yeah, so then you just don't even accelerators. Yeah, exactly. yeah, and so like you don't even have the the potential for this, uh, you know, for for like this runaway chain reaction because there literally is no chain reaction. Yeah, um, it's, it's just so funny though because hearing you talk about it, it's like, uh, and this is like a problem I have also because there. What you're saying is like it's so pro in the space that like like you're you're speaking about nuclear very favorably, and you are like the thing that like ninety nine percent of people need to hear to like like nuclear. But just because I've been so deep in it, there's these like little things that you say that then I want to be like, but no, but no, 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 you don't understand the fine nuance of it. The fine nuance is that <laughs> the chain reaction was never a problem to begin with with light water because it's naturally self moderate or something like that. And then it's so funny because like how can you bring everyone up to like up to that level? Um, and I and I think like I think there's like levels of understanding with nuclear. Like the first level of understanding is having to go from like no Chernobyl didn't kill millions of people. Right. Um, and then the second level is you know, maybe the level that you're at now, which is we have solutions for everything. And then the level that and sorry if this is self-aggrandizing, but the level that I think I'm at is no, it's not that we have solutions for everything. It's that those things aren't a problem. They're like they're mischaracterized problems to begin with, um, and so I don't know. I just but, but then then you got to think. Okay, well then, let's get practical about all this. Like you know, if we want to advance in society, you don't have to educate everyone in the world, right? You just have to like attack. Like where does the problem actually exist? If it's a policy problem, if it's an economic problem, if it's a you know a cultural issue, can you just like attack that issue, solve that issue, and then kind of build and grow from there. Um, does that kind of align with your other learnings about progress and technology? <sighs> yes. Um, so the challenge with nuclear is that the problems have been going on for so long, a generation or two, that they've kind of now metastasized to the entire industry. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's like trying to it's like trying to cure a stage four cancer. Yeah. 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 Um, and so um, so okay after after a month or two of, of of solid research on this, here's kind of roughly where I am in terms of trying to summarize. Let let me summarize my current understanding of like a very complex picture of kind of what went wrong and how we got here. Yeah. And then you know cure and maybe maybe you have some some good um, uh, riff on this. Um, okay, so first off, nuclear technology was born in wartime, and it made its introduction to the world as this horrific, dramatically destructive weapon. I think that is actually very significant to understanding what happened. Um, because then, well, first, for several, first it was considered all nuclear technology of any form, even nuclear power, which is, of course, not a weapon, but any nuclear anything was considered uh, a very strategic geopolitical asset, probably very wise to consider it that way in the early years, right? Um, uh, but it was so it was under the exclusive control of the, mil the U.S. military bureaucracy for for many years, and then even when it emerged from that, it was sort of always under this kind of very tight um, government control. And when it did emerge uh, into civilian use cases, it ran smack into kind of uh, the combined efforts of the anti-war movement and the environmentalist movement of the 1960s and 70s, right? And so you had the anti-war folks who were anti-nuclear weapons. And, and, and became anti-nuclear anything. Um, and then you had the environmentalist folks who were, uh, you know, sort of like, they had that ergophobia and were anti-energy, anti sort of anything industrial and, and kind of like advanced technology, right? Which they saw as destroy. And so, and, and like, I mean, if you, if you have any kind of initial fear or suspicion of technology, and then there's some technology that is somehow linked in any way to like the most destructive weapon we have ever created, um, and by the way, it also has this radiation thing that's like super scary and can kill you. Uh, like, yeah, okay, it's 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 it, it's no surprise that they were going to be like very much against nuclear power. So you know, the combination of these things, you've got this sort of like tight government bureaucracy, and then you have this social movement that's very against the technology, just combined to create this like really turbulent and rapidly escalating regulatory environment in um, especially the sort of late late sixties and and into the early seventies. And so then you ask, okay, so like what forces might counter this? Well, um, like this is naturally the sort of thing that's going to lead to like a lot of cost increases as you make things more complicated and difficult. Well, who would possibly counter this? 
Well, um, one thing that counters cost increases is to have uh, sort of like um, a, a, a free market with kind of competition and like buyers who care about like costs and stuff. And that is exactly what we did not have and essentially no one has ever had in, in, in energy, right, in, in electricity. The electricity markets in the US and around the world are typically regulated monopolies. Like they don't have an incentive to cut costs. And in fact, the, the way they're done in the US at least, there's this perverse incentive to, to increase costs, which is the um, the cost plus model or the rate basing, where you've got essentially, you know, the the the, the cost a utility is allowed to charge is like their it, it, the price they're allowed to charge is their cost plus a guaranteed rate of return, right? Guaranteed rate of return is, I feel like, a, a term that should just like strike fear into an economist's heart because like it literally says that the higher your costs are, the higher your profit will be, yeah. right? Um, so there was no there was no cost fighting, you know, from that angle. Um, and then, you know, and then how did the rest of the industry respond? Well, um, I mean, this is a thing that, that you have told me and that I had also gleaned from other sources, which is they essentially just pivoted into regulatory capture, right? Yep. Um, uh, you know, very profitable to retrofit nuclear plants with- Yeah, can uh, you just explain what plants. regulatory capture is to people who maybe haven't- Oh yeah, sure. So um, regulatory capture is this concept from economics where um, essentially a, a for-profit business can take advantage of regulation to give themselves a competitive advantage and therefore capture, uh, you know, uh, uh, profits that they wouldn't be able to achieve if that if that regulation weren't there. Um, and you see this pretty much any time that there is any kind of licensing or certification, um, all the way from a, uh, a you know a, a pharmaceutical company that uh, has an advantage because it's got it's been through the FDA approval process. And it's difficult for incumbents to like get through, or sorry, it's difficult for for new entrants to uh, to you know to get through that process, um, all the way down to like literally the hairdresser who has a license uh, from the state or the county, and it's difficult for new hairdressers to come along and compete because they have to go through a bunch of training hours of training and get that license, right? At, at every level, you've got this phenomenon where uh, incumbents have a competitive advantage by they've either been through the licensing process or um, another uh, another form of this is just when there's like heavy ongoing compliance costs. It favors large incumbents because they have the legal staff and the compliance department and you know they have the 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 overhead to to pay all those compliance costs whereas a tiny startup entrant uh, you know cannot cannot compete that way. So that's the the basic concept of regulatory capture. So um, yeah, you know when you when you've made um, very low levels of radiation, uh, far below background level, far below what is kind of rationally uh, harmful to human health, and you've made those levels of radiation into a thing that you can profit from shielding people from and uh, protecting against release of and cleaning up, quote unquote, when it's out there. Like you've just created all these profit incentives that are only there because of uh, the, you know, the the safety regulation. That drive so, up the cost of nuclear energy and is coming from the nuclear industry. And exactly. Well, it's coming from this. I think it's this whole thicket of, um, you know, it's the combination of uh, the the regulations. The, um, the the utility companies and the way the entire utility market is structured, the the nuclear companies themselves, and then the social kind of substrate of this this very anti nuclear attitude in society. It's all of those things working together to create this very complex problem, and that's why I say it's like this thing. It's okay, and then after generations of this go on, well, now what do you have? Well, now like. Nuclear engineering is just like not the top field for kind of that you would direct a young ambitious engineer into, right? Um, not that there aren't some some very talented and ambitious people in there. There are, fortunately, but like it's not where the fire hose of talent has been pointed, right? It's been pointed into things like computers and finance, and like that's where you can go make a bunch of money if you're smart. Um, we, you know, nuclear nuclear is not that uh, place. And um, there's this social, socially reinforced thing as well, where like the very overreaction to, uh, to, to radiation releases convinces people further that those releases are, uh, you know, are harmful, right? Like, you know, people will, if you ask people, well, why is, why is a, um, a nuclear accident so dangerous? They'll say, well, like, well, don't you know Chernobyl is still shut down and, and they won't let new people in there? And don't you know they had to evacuate 100,000 people out of Fukushima? And 
<laughs> right? And so it's this thing where the very overreaction itself becomes the proof to society that the that, that reaction was needed. So that's why I say we're in this very difficult you know, position of metastasis where um, the problems are everywhere. And uh, you know, the supply chain has been decimated, right? The, um, uh, it's just, it, it, it's everywhere. So yeah, it's, it's a very difficult problem. become to ever up. more ingrained. Yeah. Um, I, by the way, I think that you described it perfectly. Like I, I know you said I could riff off it. I don't think I need to. Like that was the greatest <laughs> history of nuclear technology I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks. Um, okay. Uh, now I've got to ask the question though. You study more than nuclear. Have you seen lessons learned from other examples or other industries that can maybe be applied to course correct the stage four cancer? Yeah. I'm asking myself, is there is there an example I know of of anything that has come back from this kind of thing? Well, uh, let me... So I think that there are some areas of technology that stagnated and where we are beginning to see a renaissance. And there are some signs that it could happen in nuclear as well. So maybe let me approach it from that angle. So I think um, nuclear is not the only technology that we were quote unquote promised in around the 1950s. Um, so there are a couple others. So, so some of the other biggest examples are from aerospace, right? So 1969, we put a man on the moon and uh, we haven't been back there since, right? So that's kind of, so space technology sort of hit this huge height and then it stagnated. Um, and then, uh, you know, the other thing that sort of was a promise and almost arrived and then went away was uh, supersonic air transport, right? So we got the Concorde in the seventies um, and yet it was, the Concorde never became affordable, even to sort of business travelers. It was always this sort of bucket list item. You know, I mean, a ticket cost like $20,000 in today's money. And it was just like, it, it was not the sort of thing, you didn't do it for travel. You did it almost for fun or for luxury, or if you were already super rich and, you know, you just wanted to show off maybe that you were super rich or you kind of thought the plane looked cool or something, but it was like, uh, you know, so, um, so uh, in both of those areas, kind of what killed it was, um, was ironically a lot of uh, government attention and funding that pushed the technologies forward, not on, uh, but a sort of uh, in both cases, both space and supersonic were kind of done as national prestige projects. These sort of, mm. um, the sort of national grandstanding, almost a part of the Cold War. I mean, the space absolutely was part of the Cold War, right? And I think supersonic to some extent as well, that it was kind of like, look, let's show off that our political system and our nation is the one that can make this technological breakthrough. And um, that is not a basis for sustainable technology and industry. That is exactly how you set up a flash in the pan, you know, in, in historical terms, where you, you achieve this great height and then it just you lose all the energy, right? I mean, once we we got been to the moon, it was clear that we were far ahead of the Soviets. Why are we spending taxpayers' money on this anymore? Again, remind me. We hit we hit Kennedy's goal. Yeah. Um. You know, it's time to we have other priorities now, especially when the I mean, you know, Apollo came right before like the oil shocks and and every and uh, everything. So. So um, you know, the lesson from aerospace, I think. So if you look at what's happening now. Well, aerospace is starting to see a renaissance. Um, we have, and, and, and what is it? Well, it's a private renaissance, right? We have, I mean, private renaissance with, in some cases, certainly some cooperation and collaboration of government, right? But it's, um, it's companies like SpaceX, uh, Blue Origin, Boom Supersonic. These are the ones, the companies that are, that are trying to bring these technologies back and they're trying to do it back. They're trying to bring it back on an economic basis by driving the costs down to the point where you can actually get customers to pay for this, right? And so SpaceX is driving costs down with their reusable ro rockets. And I mean, Blue Origin is doing similar things. Uh, Boom Supersonic has a plan to make supersonic uh, flights available for more like $5,000, not 20,000. Now that's still expensive, um, but that is within the reach of like 
business class, you know, long distance travel, right? They are planning to, to actually sell tickets to people who want to fly, not just people who want a, uh, you know, some, some crazy, uh, uh, you know, fun experience. Um, and Boom, by the way, you know, wants to, uh, I mean, their, their very long-term plan is to drive the cost down even more and right? not to yeah. keep it at $5,000 forever, but eventually, you know, to make it available to, to, to everybody, even economy, you know, seats on these planes. But you, you start just like Tesla started with the high-end, you know, Roadster and then like went, systematically drove the cost down and down, you know, that's also Boom's plan. So I think like the fundamental lesson out of all of this is if you want to bring nuclear back, the way to do it is to make it economical, like yeah. to actually make it cheap the way it deserves to be, yeah. right? Don't, I mean, I think some people want to bring nuclear back um, based on sort of climate concerns. And because of that, they want to, they're taking an approach where it's like, well, let's just get governments to commit to it and pour lots of money into it and mandate it and, you know, so on and so forth. And um, if you if you really want to, I would say, bring nuclear back in a solid, long lasting way that, that you know, an unkillable way, make it profitable. I couldn't agree make more. It cheap. Make it cheap, um, have it deliver energy to the world. I mean, it's really, it's the cost increases that, that killed it. And I think actually, um, you know, I, I, <laughs> I say that it's kind of the greatest trick the devil ever pulled is convincing the world that nuclear is inherently expensive. Um, I think that has actually killed the industry like much worse than an outright ban, you know, sort of ever could have, right? If nuclear had just been banned outright, you'd have all the forces of capitalism working to bring it back. Yep. Um, but, but by convincing the world that nuclear is sort of inherently expensive, today even the capitalists don't want to touch it. Yeah. But what we are seeing and sort of the hope for a nuclear renaissance is we are seeing the sort of new generation. Okay, so what so what is it going to take to fix this metastasis? I think it's kind of... It's sort of fundamentally two things. Um, one, uh, I think we need nuclear startups uh, who are going to come along and essentially infuse fresh energy, motivation, um, and strategic thinking into this, uh, you know, into this industry. Um, and we are seeing now a, a kind of generation of like mission-driven founders who are looking at this morass and saying, "I'm going to find some way to make this work anyway because it's just so important for the future." Um, so I think that's a great and really hopeful thing. And so what we need then uh, is, is, is in combination with the nuclear startup, uh, with, with all those mission-driven founders, is uh, we also just need to somehow fix or find ways to work around the regulatory um, you know, thicket that we're in right now. Yeah. Um, and so uh, you know, there are some companies that are just plowing through that regulatory thicket with lots and lots of money. Um, there are other companies that are trying to find more creative ways um, uh, maybe to, to, to work with the NRC in the most minimal um, sort of fashion and like get through cheaper um, than has been done in the past. And then there are other folks that are just saying, you know, actually, this is not going to start in the US. This is going to start elsewhere. And let's find a kind of friendlier international venue. And like, um, you know, I think... Uh, Maybe, hopefully, if we if 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 this new you know the new generation of nuclear technology could be proven outside the U.S., that combined with um, sort of shifting political winds in the U.S., you know, is the sort of thing that would give us a hope for reform in the U.S. in the and and more broadly in the West over the coming decades. Wow, you have uh, given us a lot to think about there. Um... Okay, um, and you know, since we only have so much time, uh, can you maybe tie this into a broader theme? If you were to kind of, uh, I, I don't know, do you want to give away the secrets of your book or not give it away or whatever you want to do, tie, tie it to something that the audience can latch on to now that you've kind of shown extreme competency in nuclear um, <laughs> to, to, to then follow you for your other ideas too, which are also awesome. Thanks. Well, sure. So I think the broader theme to tie into here is um, technological stagnation, uh, which is a, a theme that a number of people have been talking about now for about a decade. Peter Thiel is one of the first who started talking about it about a decade ago. Tyler Cowen, who we've already mentioned, wrote a book called The Great Stagnation in 2011. Um, Robert Gordon wrote a book called The Rise and Fall of American Growth um, a, a few years after that, uh, which is interesting, although I disagree with his projections for the future because he doesn't see a lot of growth uh, potential in the future. Um, and uh, so there's been this general theme of kind of saying, if you look over the last 50 years or so, since roughly 1970, technology has actually slowed down, hasn't gone to zero. There's been a lot of progress, but if you just compare it, and, and there's been more progress than, you know, uh, any time before the Industrial Revolution, 
let's let's you know let's not get too pessimistic here. But if you compare the last 50 years to the equivalent period 100 years prior, so look at the the, the period from 1870 to 1920. That was a period of amazing change that actually, you know, was was where things were racking ahead even faster than in the than in the last 50 years. In that period, we got um, the growth of the oil industry, the invention of the internal combustion engine, and its application to both automobiles and airplanes. Uh, we got the uh, invention of the light bulb and the electric generator and motor, and the entire build out of the electrical industry. Uh, we got the really the application of um, applied chemistry, the first pharmaceutical companies. Um, you know, aspirin, one of the first sort of marketed drugs. Um, the uh, some of the very first um, antibiotics, although the real antibiotic revolution wouldn't come until um, sort of the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Um, we got some of the very first plastics, uh, like Bakelite. Um, we got uh, the telephone uh, and radio, and then uh, just after that period came sort of television. Um, really, the whole germ theory was sort of uh, developed and, and applied in that time. We got water sanitation systems, and rates of disease started coming down fairly dramatically. We got some of the first vaccines since uh, you know Edward Jenner's smallpox vaccine, which is almost a century earlier. So just like across the board, there were like five technological revolutions going on all at once that affected the entire economy. Yeah. Um, and then you look at the last fifty years, and what did we get? Well, we got the to computer revolution and the internet, which was amazing. Let me not, I don't want to downplay that at all. That was absolutely amazing. And then we got like some stuff in genetic engineering, although we've really only scratched the surface of that yeah. so far, yeah. right? And like manufacturing, we're still making stuff in factories kind yeah. of the way we did, you know, in the 60s and 70s, only now with computer control, right? And like, um, you know, like airplanes, airplanes haven't gotten any faster. You know, they've gotten safer, sure, they've gotten cheaper, but like they're actually gotten a little slower since like the edge, right? Um, you know, cars are fundamentally the same. Again, they're safer and they've got cameras in them now. That's cool, right? But like, you know, there just hasn't been this fundamental, there's been nothing as fundamental as the invention of the car, the invention of the yeah, airplane yeah. or even the jet engine, right? And so, um, you know, when you look at it, it's kind of like to claim that we've had as much progress in the last 50 years as we did in that previous period is sort of to is to claim that like computers and the internet are as big as like you know telephone radio um uh right the germ theory the internal combustion engine electricity the light bulb like all of those things put together and it just doesn't make sense it just right. you just can't really claim that so when you look broadly you have to see that um, that yeah, progress has has kind of slowed down, um, and the other way to see this is to look at uh, to tie it into our theme, you know, here in this venue is to look at the things that people thought were going to happen 50, 60, 70 years ago that did not happen. Nuclear is like number one on that list. Um, like I said, supersonic transport, space exploration and colonization, um, you know, and and uh, sort of all of these things that that people thought were going to come, that the sci-fi future that we were quote unquote promised, and and that didn't make it here. And so when you look um, when you look at this, uh, I see a few kind of big things that happened, um, and these are all uh, these are all themes that you'll find in that uh, flying car book, uh, by the way, and you'll find in my in my book review of that book. Um, they pretty much accord with my own research. Um, so one is as in as in nuclear, uh, this dramatic growth of regulation. Um, and regulation really beyond uh, what is, in my opinion, kind of necessary or justified for safety and, and kind of human health. Um, a, a large degree of safety theater, I think, is, is, the, is the term for it. Um, and I think it happened not only, you know, not only in nuclear, but in a lot of other, uh, a lot of other places. Um, and then uh, another interesting theme is just the centralization and bureaucratization of funding for science and research. Um, so before World War II, the federal government did not do a lot of sort of research funding. And since then, it has more or less taken over the field. Mm. The NIH is a 40 plus billion dollar uh, budget now. The NSF is another, you know, 8 billion or so on top of that. Um, and uh, I mean, the NIH just pretty much dominates biological, you know, biomedical um, research these days. It's not the it's not the sole player, but it's just so huge that by its weight, you kind of have to play by its rules if you yeah. if you want to get anything done. Um, and, uh, you know, centralizing and bureaucratizing funding is, it's just a way to miss breakthrough opportunities. And create um, a lot of groupthink. Yes. Yeah. 
yeah, yeah. Um, so the, the sort of consensus and group thing, especially when you adopt the kind of uh, the, uh, the, the committee-based peer review model that the NIH and the NSF use for grant proposals, right? DARPA, at least, um, ha- is a little bit more like pick a program manager and let them run with things. Yeah. And I think DARPA has been more successful. Um, and that's a, you know, that's sort of a very interesting model to look for. But I think like, you know, even if the NIH is like a good model to fund some stuff, I don't think we should have any one model funding everything um, or, or, or really dominating kind of the way it does. And if we are going to have something, you know, it, like this, this, this peer review based committee based groupthink model is, is like one of the worst models you can come up with to, 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 to make fundamental breakthroughs that are, these are things that by definition sort of challenge the status quo. The third thing, um, and to tie it back to my work, is just fundamental cultural attitudes towards progress. Do we believe in progress? And um, the, I think on the, if you look on the broad sweep of the last uh, few centuries, I think people really did believe in progress in the 19th century. Um, they had even perhaps a naive optimism about how easy or inevitable progress would be and how um, uh, uh, material progress would go along with moral and social progress. And uh, it was just, everything was gonna be great. And they kind of you know didn't see any problems at all. And, um, I, the 20th century, I think, ran smack into some of the problems of progress and some of the disconnect, by the way, between moral and, and material progress. Um, as you know, you got the, the amazing technology of the, of the 30s and 40s combined with the world wars, uh, right? We just, we just saw, wow, these things are going in like opposite directions. And in fact, technology, technology is not only promoting moral progress, but it's making war more horrific and destructive. Um, you know, that's just one example of a number of things people got worried about environmental impacts. Um, they got worried about unintended consequences of technology, obviously job loss and going along with automation and many, many things, you know, concerns came to the fore. And I think what happened was the culture sort of turned against progress in the 20th century. Uh, and we sort of threw the baby out with the bathwater, right? Rather than just confront the real problems head on and try to come up with solutions to them, um, we turned into this very reactionary mode. I think I think the reactionary wing that had always been there ever since the 19th century and even before came to the forefront and, um, and, and was able to influence the conversation like never before. And so my basic thesis is we need a new philosophy of progress for the 21st century. We need to rescue the baby from the bathwater. We need to figure out how to confront the real problems uh, of technology and, and industry and progress, but make forward, you know, but, but without throwing out progress itself, let's find ways to make, go, to, to go forward in a way that is safe, is healthy, um, and, and it works for everybody, uh, you know, and, and make sure that the whole world benefits from progress. And uh, I think that's how we need to go forward, but we need to rescue this concept. And I think rescuing the concept begins with history. It begins with a retelling of the story of progress, going back and just reminding people what we've forgotten. I think too many people just take for granted this amazing world that we've all been born into, the standard of living that we now enjoy, um, the, the health and comfort and safety and, uh, and just the lives that we can live. This is a gift from our ancestors. It is something people did not have a couple hundred years ago. And it's something that we should not take for granted. We should, um, we should, we should have gratitude for that. We should look around at the industrial civilization with, with awe and amazement and wonder. And, and we should look at things that seem ordinary like steel girders and plate glass windows and paved roads and like fresh fruit in the supermarket and hot running water from the tap and air conditioning and like, you know, and, and electricity and light bulbs and all these things should just, we should see all of these things as like, wow, this is amazing. This is, I'm, I'm so grateful for this gift. Thank you. And I'm going to pay it forward to future generations by making sure that their standard of living is as much better compared to ours today as ours is compared to that of 200 years ago. And so that's what my work is. I am, uh, you know, trying to make the story of, of human progress um, accessible to a broader audience, not bound up in sort of academic uh, economic history, but really bring it out there in a way that, that anybody can, uh, can read and enjoy. And, and to start to use that to establish this new philosophy of progress that we can take um, you know, to go forward with in the 21st century. So if, if, you, if you do want to find out more about my work, uh, rootsofprogress.org is my website, and it's where you can find those essays and, and learn more about uh, the things that I'm doing. And then uh, I'm also pretty active on Twitter as Jason Crawford, so look me up there. Jason Crawford, everybody. And initiate at least a new approach to the many difficult problems that must be solved in both private and public conversation. If the world is to take off the inertia 
imposed by fear and is to make positive progress toward peace.